Hi, um, I hope everything works out now just fine for you. Um, we present to you today uh, immersive audio for VR escape rooms um, from Assassin's Creed to Prince of Persia. Um, we are the Ubisoft Audio Services Düsseldorf. Uh, over to my right hand side is uh, Tino Schleinitz, uh, he's our uh, lead audio um, designer uh, responsible for all the technology going on in our department and uh, I'm Stefan Hanselhofer, I'm the audio director uh, here at Ubisoft in Düsseldorf. Um, today we want to talk about uh, our Ubisoft Escape Games um, that we created together with a really, really, really cool uh, team here in Düsseldorf over the past few years. Uh, it's actually a series of uh, business to business games that are um, uh, that are there for uh, uh, for uh, entertainment directly in uh, in various places um, um, online so uh, the, the what we want to say here is please use your headphones um, uh, we do have oh I skipped one slide can it just go back do you know just to, because we want to give the people the, the, the introduction to the... So, uh, because the Ubisoft Escape Room games, uh, they started out with uh, Escape the Lost Pyramid, um, which is a, a very, very cool title uh, playing in the uh, Assassin's Creed uh, Origins series. Um, then uh, we did uh, Beyond Medusa Skate, uh, which is playing in AC uh, Odyssey uh, environment. And, uh, and the last one, we did one of the first revivals of the uh, Prince of Persia uh, IP, and it is called Dagger of Time. Um, go out there, check them out. Uh, they're really, really cool. Please use your headphones. Um, we hope, we, we, we submitting the stream in stereo and we hope that you also can hear it in stereo because a lot of the stuff that we want to show you is based on binaural audio and your headphones. So if you have your headphones, if you don't have your headphones on, put them on now um, and hopefully everything works out properly via the stream. Um, so then let's talk VR audio. So with VR audio, there are tons of terms that popping up uh, all the time from uh, uh, spatial audio to head-locked binaural uh, early reflections. There are tons of terms that popping up uh, in, in, in that regard. And But we, for this presentation, want to focus on a few of those. Um, actually, we want to focus on uh, ambisonic, spatial audio, HRTF, binaural and 3D audio. Um, and the important thing for us is now to let's agree up on terms because the point is there are tons of uh, those names and technologies out there, but it's a little bit uncertain uh, what they mean and what they do so that we have the possibility to explain to you what we, we've been up to. Uh, we want to agree on a few of those terms. So first of all, there is 3D audio and 3D audio is mainly a, rather a marketing term um, than a, a clearly defined technical term. Um, the point is, you hear 3D audio a lot over the course of the last uh, uh, weeks and uh, uh, month and years. Um, basically, there, this is not a technical thing um, because there is no clear definition of how you arrive at 3D audio because it means mainly that there is audio all around you. Um, there are ways to, to get there and actually this is where I hand over to Tino because he will explain a little bit of the um, technical background and some of the technology that we are using to arrive at 3D audio. So, Tino. Yes, um, so let me explain a bit. So if we look at actually what the human being can actually perceive in terms of direction, so where audio is coming from, um, we have three different layers that we can actually look at, which is the frontal plane, median plane, and the horizontal plane. And we want to do, like, just show you three concepts uh, that actually exist. So there is uh, interaural level difference. That basically means uh, and a sound that is closer to you is basically louder than a, um, or perceived loudness is, is higher than actually uh, if it's f further away from you. That's the interaural level difference. There's also interaural time difference. So since we're human beings, we have two ears. That basically means if a sound is coming more from the left, 
the time difference between when the, the sound arrives on the left ear is different than it arrives from the right ear. And that gap in between these, this time difference between the two ears, it's actually called internal time difference. And it tells us a lot about um, where the sound is coming from, because we as humans are used to these yeah, time differences, and then we can pinpoint uh, the direction. And the last thing we're going to talk about is head-related transfer functions. Just uh, 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 if you want to more go deep into that, head-related transfer functions in general describes also the other terms that I just described, like internal time difference. But it gives you an understanding if is something coming more from the top or from, from below of you. And we're using these concepts uh, a lot in our recreation of the sound. Just to give you a little bit more insight on HRTF in general, um, since our ear is shaped in a specific form, um, it is you can actually differentiate just by the frequency bands. And you see it on the right hand side, there's different frequency bands shapes uh, regarding on what is the actual angle a sound is coming from. So you see also if it's coming from, from top, it's very different, for example, for the other ones. Um, and also, it is giving you not only the information from your ear, but also from your body. So also your shoulders, your chin, your head, and so on. Also gives you a lot of information where the, uh, just by the coloration of the sound gives you a lot of information about uh, where the sound is uh, coming from. There's also the concept of personalized HRTF, just to give you a short glimpse of that, since every ear is very different. So we have all have different ear shapes. We can here agree on one shape, uh, which is let's say, the, the common ground shape on, on that. But there is also uh, ideas where you photograph your ear and then adapt it accordingly. How we you reproduce this in game um, is the big question. So there are several ways of doing that. One very common approach is, for example, also from the, from the history, like uh, a long time ago when actually people first start uh, experience with that, is an artificial hat that you could use. So that's what you see on the, on the left side. And uh, we're going to talk about the concept in general of binaural, which basically means having or relating to two ears. Um, the artificial hat is really a recreation of your hat. Um, including all the shapes of your head, but also of your ears. And there's also a concept of the Jacqueline disc, which is uh, next to it that you can see, which is more like a yeah, simplified version of the artificial head. So we can place this um, um, object, like the artificial head, there's uh, microphones in the ears. We can actually place it in the world and then just do a recording. And the very famous recording of that you may have heard of is from David Webb, which is the virtual barbershop. So it just gives you a short example of what it sounds like. Uh, we're not going to go too much into it, but you will hear some uh, um, like some scissors actually close to your ear on the left hand side and you will also perceive it from the back or on top of you. Now, as I begin a clipping, and I bring the clippers closer to your ear, very closer to the right ear. Follow me as I move around the back of the head to the left ear, and up and over the top of the head. Okay. Just to give you an example of what that sounds like, you may have heard this already. The problem for us is uh, in games, that's a nice concept uh, for that we, how we record if we work in linear media. For interactive media, we basically have the concept, which is like a common concept also for uh, other games, with an emitter and uh, a listener. Um, we have uh, information about position, rotating and scaling, and of course, like the relation to the listener. All of that gives us a lot of information where a sound comes from. Also, the scale factor tells us a lot about, if you remember, like uh, how close a sound is uh, by, by perceived loudness, also gives a lot of information of that. So we use rendering to actually re yeah, reimaging this uh, uh, concept that we just showed you. Um, one important thing is like we are audio is always binaural because like uh, due to the um, headset that you're wearing, basically the um, the headphone is always either included or you wear your own headphones, and that uh, allows us to use HRTF and like a lot of these concepts to um, increase the the immersion. Then the, uh, another term is spatial audio that we just said. So spatial audio in general means like that you have more than just one channel. 
Um, and we could use all of the physical phenomena of sound like time, dynamic time differences, time difference and HRTF and recreate it with our, yeah, with these P basically use volume, delay and filter to recreate these uh, behaviors. And if it's not possible to do that in the engine, we're going to show some uh, uh, examples. Um, we can also uh, uh, process that with ambisonics. So ambisonics is in general just the concept of either recording something or uh, recreating it. And it is uh, recording a sound field. So maybe some of you uh, already know the concepts. Um, so there's, uh, uh, for example, right hand side of an, uh, an ambisonic microphone, first order. Um, that allows you to record uh, up, down, left, right, front and back. So it basically records in any possible direction and we record only a sound field and then later in, uh, re processing these, we can uh, give a direction where the listener is actually uh, looking at. So that way it allows us to create, for example, ambiences, cutscenes, music and effects, everything that you um, yeah, produce before you actually put it in game. Uh, it's easy to use that just that you heard of that. And then uh, we also have the, uh, just gonna give you a glimpse of VR audio pipeline. So we have on the left hand side our game engine, this could be any engine that you uh, mentioned that has the concepts with emitter, position, rotating, scaling, all of that information we put in our middleware, uh, which is wise in, in, uh, and yeah, for us. And then we basically can render these into multi-channel output uh, for the consumer, for the, for the listener. Um, for us, we also use binaural render for, for the VR games, um, which basically puts out a two-channel um, um, yeah, sound for with HRTF. And there you have again the 3D audio, all of these concepts, because it's a binaural specialized audio output, again is 3D audio. There is a, a lot of uh, uh, companies doing that, so um, just to give you um, a glimpse here, so there is Dolby Atmos, Oculus, Resonance Audio and Steam Audio basically provide these. All of these use one way or the other these concepts to um, reimagine that and then yeah, that's, that's what they do. And uh, why all the fuss, Stefan? Why are we all doing that? Yeah. Uh, uh there is so much stuff that, that, <laughs> that you can do. As you have seen, there are so much technology around and all of that can play together. So it's really the question, why do we do all of that technology? What is important about that? And basically, uh, as it is with other games as well, but here I think even a step further, it's about immersion. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's what we want to achieve uh, in a game and in VR especially, we want to achieve uh, that the people are going, uh, 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 that the people having this feeling of really being there because it's the, the only platform that allows you to make the thing, uh, to, to be really in the game at the point where, uh, where, where the players are. Uh, we have this, of course, in uh, uh, first person as well. But here with uh, VR, we are even uh, are one step closer to really being in there. Um, we have a few, uh, two examples of uh, how far this immersion can go. Okay. And jump off the front. Jump. Oh my oh, god. No. Oh. Yeah. And I really want to stress out that we are not showing this to make fun about people hurting themselves playing VR. That's not the point. The point is that those people really were so deeply immersed into the game that they, you know, jumped into a room. They knew they were in a normal room and they tried to jump there or they're running against the wall because they're so immersed into the game. What we want to achieve there uh, is actually what we call uh, audio hyperrealism. So uh, there's always the discussion, at least in my point of view, about what realism is in, in a game. Um, and in this case, we want to recreate uh, the real f or parts of the real physical behavior. That can be a good thing, that can be a bad thing, depending on the game. Uh, but uh, in general, in this case, with those methods that we described to you, uh, first, of, first of all and foremost, we want to uh, recreate this uh, realistic physical behavior. The first thing that we want to recreate there is actually the perception of distance. Um, this is something that we really took care of uh, in our escape rooms, um, um, because in our games you can really get so much closer than in any other kind of games. Of course, in the first play, uh, uh, first person game, as I already described, you can go close to a wall or you can be close to something. But the point is, 
it always stops there. You cannot really interact, uh, uh, except of uh, uh, so so you can be there. But in in VR, you can really use your hands. You can go there. You can even you know bend forward, move your head into those objects, into those uh, things that you want to listen to, and that is something that you cannot do in other games. Um, therefore, we came up with a concept that we call the audio spaces, and we basically uh, based this on. Um, uh, uh, sociology uh, uh, terms. Uh, those are terms that are used in certain ways to um, to make clear that um, to make clear that we have different uh, different uh, uh, spaces around us. First of all, we do have the public space. We do have the social space, uh, we do have the personal space, and we do have the intimate space. Uh, in, our, in regular games, you normally use the um, public and the social space, as you can see here in, in yellow. Those are the ones that you normally use in most of the games. Sometimes in first-person games you have the personal space as well, um, but in, in most of the game you're not going into the whole intimate space. Um, so this is something that that is not a fixed rule. This doesn't mean that we use those uh, meters like 3.5 meters, 1 to 3.5, all of that stuff, in a, in a way that this is how we uh, create our attenuation curves or something like that. It's rather a, a, a mental model for the team to understand that we need to think about very close things uh, around us and, and that there are a, a certain layering going on uh, in uh, to distance because sounds behave very different depending on the distance and Tino can give us a little bit more of the technology behind it. Yeah, so heads up uh, again some technical explanations so you already see a graph on the right hand side which is the frequency behavior of a narrator um, in the distance to a microphone so may Maybe somebody of you already uh, heard the proximity effect, which is basically the effect that happens when you're closer uh, to a microphone, dynamic microphone in, in, in this example. Um, so if the narrator is 60 centimeter away, um, we have a more flat curve, which is this one. <laughs> So this is just like an example of when the narrator is 60 centimeters away. You just heard that, and hers, yeah, it has different frequency spectrum if uh, we step th uh, further the microphone. So if the narrator is three centimeter or uh, yeah three centimeters away from the from the microphone, we have a boost in the lower frequencies. So again, just listen A B. If we, you see both curves now, if we listen, that's 60 centimeters, and that's 3 centimeters. So you already hear the, the effect going on here, and we use that concept uh, for a lot of our uh, sound design to actually mimic this behavior. And since you're so much used to this behavior in real life, um, you immediately recognize that. Um, yeah. And uh, also another concept is the level of detail. Um, so we have... Um, uh, um, basically, just and this is now just like uh, talking about one emitter, basically, that is on a distance. We think about uh, uh, um, some gears or like a watch or something. If it's further away from you, uh, we hear just a, like a generic loop. If we actually hold the watch, for example, closer to our ears, um, we actually multiply this like with different layers. So uh, it could be a generic loop from a ticking clock. And if we get it closer, we also hear like several gears turning, a spring rattle ticking and so on. To give you an example of what it looks like, uh, we have here, for example, if a uh, watch further away from you, and uh, this could look, sound like this. So it is very quiet on purpose because it's further away and it's very simple to come closer and actually having the watch really close to our ear. We hear all the smaller details of the of the watch. That's another concept that we're using. And then we extend this also with clustering. And what does that mean, Stefan, clustering? <laughs> Yeah, clustering is actually something that we use a lot in uh, in uh, other games that we are doing, like in the Anno uh, 1800 uh, uh, installment that we uh, that we did, where you are, have the possibility to be 300 meters above ground and then you can zoom into almost first-person uh, perspective. Uh, the point is, 
uh, when you go closer there, we, we open up uh, the level of detail. So this means when you're out there, uh, uh, the level of details in the buildings. What we did there is now for the VR games, we basically shifted that uh, uh, down and went down the zoom level. So that means you are, for example, in, in on a place where there is a bigger object in front of you, let's say a ship or something. And when you are further away, like you see now, um, with the on the right hand side there is the, the listener, as already described Platino, and the left hand side is the emitter, then the ship uh, emits general sounds of like a far distant ship. The closer you get, um, you, uh, the, the more uh, separate objects uh, we, we open up. And, uh, and you even see this on the, the white circles are the, the attenuation curves. So the, 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 the behavior of the sound over distance. So when you go uh, even a step further to the next uh, sound, um, you get more details. So in this case, this would be the ship. The second one would be being in front of the ship and hearing screeching from the, from the, from the right-hand side of the ship or from the left-hand side. And when you go uh, on a more specific place, for example, where you can lift uh, um, uh, where I can work with some uh, uh, some wheels on the ship, uh, you could even go there and put your head really close to this, and the the the, the clicking and uh, and the the the, the 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 noises of of, uh, of the objects that you're moving would be right and left hand side. So it's a level of detail. The closer you get, the more detail uh, uh, in position you also have. Um, Tina will show you a little bit how we use that in our um, VR escape games. Exactly. So we have one example for you where this concept uh, uh, could be used. Uh, on the right hand side, you have uh, a wall of gears. Um, so these are, you cannot really see from here, but there's like a, a lot of gears actually spinning. So uh, looking from this per, um, distance, we would hear one emitter uh, playing a generic loop, which could sound like that. And if we come closer, basically this emitter will split in two separate emitters, play, uh, now playing from, from different positions. So uh, you see the large gears in the background. These uh, could now resemble like the, the, the different uh, gears. And now we have two sounds playing at the same time from two directions. And if we come even closer, now these two again split up in several emitters. Now uh, every gear has its own emitter playing its own uh, loop or one shots for representing the, 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 yeah, the, the gears. Uh, and now you can actually really look around, you can actually hear them uh, in, in the right position. So we not only have uh, now one loop playing from the middle, but we have now elevation also for a gear playing more from, from top or from, from the bottom. And if you come, that sounds like that. And now if we come even further, so let's say we're standing right in front, and that's what Stefan meant by the, like, the, uh, um, like the intimate space. If you're actually really standing in front of a gear, that could look like that. And now you hear also like the friction between the different gears. You hear like several clickings from different positions. Um, and we also allow here, for example, um, for just for you to, from the transition from one to another, that all the emitters will stay alive. So let's say the two emitters that you see on the gear stay alive until they uh, actually don't have to play anything uh, anymore, and then like they disappear, and other emitters take over representing the, the, uh, yeah, the wall of the gears. Just listen to that example. And you may also hear now the proximity effect a bit, so that you actually hear also lower frequencies from something that's really happening in front of you. So yeah, that's an example in game. And uh, we also use uh, voice over IP. And what are we doing there, Stefan, <laughs> for voice over yeah. IP? So for voice over IP, that is uh, really uh, beautiful because I think um, 
that was one of the things that, that I was very keen on, especially in our escape rooms, because uh, the, the, the beauty of the whole thing is that normally when you play something together, um, uh, you normally have a voice over IP chat that just uses it like a telephone, you know, like, uh, like having a normal uh, phone call. So basically you use your Discord and therefore you hear the other people talking. In this case, you know that our game um, is all about uh, location-based um, uh, VR. That means you're going to those arcades with your friends, you're standing in the same room and you experience this game together and try to get out of this room, therefore escape rooms. Um, and the important thing, of course, about that is it's not just something that you do and everybody on his own. It's all about communi uh, communicating, telling the other people, hey, I found this over here, hey, can you throw that there? Or, you know, it's, it's about communication. And what I thought... Uh, is really important about that is that we need to have immersion there. We need to have the possibility uh, to to really feel that the people are, you know, 50 meters away in that room and just need to shout over to us. And that is something that we did um, uh, 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 for, for those games. So we, we used the microphone of the headsets and rerouted them into Wise. And uh, Tino will tell you a little bit how we treated them because that was really important about creating nice immersion there. Yes, um, so there are three examples we're going to uh, listen to now in the, in the video. Um, so one would be, for example, we suppressed voice when in the closed rooms. Um, so you will see in the video now um, a person inside a closed room and you can barely hear the other person like a bit muffled uh, from the outside, which is on purpose because like that actually gives you the immersion of somebody's outside. Um, we're also adapting the vibration uh, on the size of the room, so you actually hear that you're in a smaller room by uh, putting reverb on your own uh, voice, ex also for the other person uh, that is in a different space. And we also have audio refraction when the player is not facing the, the other player. So if you turn around, if you uh, look at the bottom and so on, and so on, we basically have refraction. So you, uh, yeah, you also hear them muffled. And th there are some uh, examples you're gonna listen to. The first one is in German, and then there's another one. So let's listen to that. Hast du schon gelöst? Ja, ich hab's geschafft. Ist draus? Ja. Ähm, ich seh dich eigentlich auch nicht. Ich seh dich auch nicht. Nein. Doch, da drüben bist du. Hier hinten. Ah, da bist du, okay. Hi. <lacht> Don't worry, I will hit you later. Oh no. <lacht> I broke the vase. What's over here? Hey, I think we... Just like finding my underwear in the morning. Hey! Okay. Uh, what? Hey, don't you be throwing things at me? Yeah! You'll need it, probably. I need you show. want this thing? Yeah, maybe. I'll try this? this one. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. perfect. Hey, you yeah. talk? Oh, yeah, thanks. Awesome. <laughs> Just <laughs> throw it at him. <laughs> I still have to it myself somewhere. Um... <laughs> So what you heard is way more interaction because like the other person actually has to scream to you to make uh, attend uh, like to actually make them visible and um, so that's a yeah great addition to to give you more immersion in in the game and then we also have word interaction yeah so um, while the whole uh, voice over IP is really cool in my opinion and it makes the the, the whole uh, uh, thing very you know, um, immersive with the other players. Uh, you need to interact with the world, as you already have seen in the video as well. You know, you pick up stuff and you need to, to grab something, you throw something, all of that stuff. Um, and therefore, there is more than you can do in other games because you can use your hands. You go there, you grab it the way that you want it, you, you can throw it, you can scratch it. All of that stuff is possible. And in other games, normally, you don't. Uh, so therefore... Um, Tina will tell you a little bit more about those details, uh, how we did that and uh, what we thought, what were our thought process there. Yeah, so we have another video for you um, showing you collision, sliding and um, any other object that you can interact with. As Stefan said, like you actually want to grab something in front of you and you can uh, move it alongside with the, uh, like with your movements, with your controller. Um, 
and you will also hear some sliding uh, on the walls. Uh, there's also some some footage of our Foley artist recording um, some of these sounds, so that you get an idea uh, how detailed we actually needed to record them. And then the last thing is mixing in VR. Yes, mixing in VR. So uh, mixing in VR is uh, mainly one thing at the moment. It's it's dreadful. Um, it's really hard. Um, uh, uh, so it's really something that doesn't make a lot of uh, uh, fun at the moment uh, because as you can see on this picture and uh, uh, this is really one of our team members, Hermann. He really has those issues. He wears glasses. Um, he needs to wear his uh, DT-707, those are the, the headphones that he's wearing to his HMD here, to his head-mounted uh, display. Um, you need to deal with all of that because in front of you is your PC um, with wires running and you want to mix there, you know, to go in there, you want to make something a little bit more louder or quieter and you need to, you know, all, do all of that and I have seen so many of my team members, you know, sitting there with, with this weird behavior and uh, clicking and then doing this again. So um, I was thinking hard about that, how to solve that and therefore uh, I was thinking in what reality do we want to mix basically. And uh, the point is, uh, do we want to mix in in our reality on the PC? Or if we are already in the virtual reality, why don't we use this reality um, and uh, mix there? So therefore, um, uh, we work together with uh, uh, Dear Reality, which is a company here in Düsseldorf. Um, and uh, we, we, we asked them to uh, provide a tool for us that they created for linear media and 360 videos, um, actually. And we uh, asked them to provide uh, to provide it for us in uh, in uh, for our setup so that we can really mix in VR. So uh, yeah, start the video and I can show a little bit what's going on there. So yes, that is an example uh, of their linear uh, uh, video uh, production that they created. So this is a tool for 360 videos where I can really do um, VR mixing. Uh, directly in that room, in your VR space, in your video. But it's linear, it's, it's time-based, and therefore we work together with them to create the same thing, uh, very uh, similar uh, in, uh, in, um, in the VR space. So you keep, your, uh, you keep your HMD on, and you create those mixes that you see in front of you, and you have the possibility to mix, to do, uh, to do some alter, uh, altering on attenuation curves, um, even debugging and searching for stuff, and every sound uh, emitter has its own nice um, 3D object. So that mixing will become way more comfortable in the future, hopefully. I hope we started that at least for all of our colleagues around the world at some point in time. Let's see if this will be, will be becoming a, a, a product that everybody can buy. At the moment, we do it for us and it works really great. I hope later on there will be uh, uh, buyable versions of that. Um, yeah, that's it from our side. Um, but uh, I also wanted to, to mention here, especially we are hiring. So the audio department here in Ubisoft uh, uh, Düsseldorf is hiring. Um, and we are searching for an audio director. So if you want to become a colleague of mine together with, so then you would be the third audio director here at the audio, uh, Ubisoft Audio Services Düsseldorf, or you want to become or already are a game tester uh, that is specialized in audio. So an audio tester, then just uh, drop us a line, uh, look out on um, Smart Recruiter and uh, just apply. Uh, we are looking for those two positions, would be great. And then at the end, there's Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, 
uh, shoot. And we're back. Yeah, it seems like we are back. So, are there any first questions? So, uh, I missed the beginning. Am I correct uh, in thinking that they adapted Assassin's Creed and other IPs to expand uh, uh, escape rooms? Uh, yes, that is true. Absolutely. So, um, we did that uh, for uh, quite some time with those three um, uh, um, with the three escape rooms uh, that we did with the team here in Düsseldorf. Um, it's Assassin's Creed uh, Origins, uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey and uh, Prince of Persia. And you can play them in a business-to-business -business model, which means location-based in uh, VR um, arcades uh, all over the world. I think they're I don't know the number at the moment, but there are a lot of them, uh, and you just need to look it up on the uh, just uh, Google Ubisoft uh, escape rooms, and you will find all the places around the world in your city. As mentioned by the speakers, VR and VPS uh, content, while similar, is vastly different in terms of uh, immersion and systems because of that. So I was wondering, all these special audio systems you are using and developed for VR first-person experiences, how many of these are applicable for regular first-person experiences, and if not, why specifically? Tino, do you want to grab that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Uh... <laughs> So, so the, the special audio systems that we're creating uh, for uh, the VR titles, um, in some cases they are based on stuff that we already created in other games, and you know we we went a little bit further and adapted them, especially when, when we're thinking about the the whole level of detail and what we what we said with the with the clustering system. So before that it was 300 meters above ground in Anno and five meters, and we just used that and scaled it down to being. Uh, uh, 20 meter in front of a ship and then on the ship directly or on the object directly. So um, those systems are reusable, um, some of them, and in some of them you need to go even a little bit more deeper and have more uh, specific technology to make it work for the specific games. But they, I would say they, they go hand in hand and the learnings that we do in the VR games can be used and facilitated in other games. And uh, to be honest, when you look at uh, developments like the PS5 and uh, uh, the, the 3D audio systems that they have uh, there, with, uh, which is called Tempest, uh, uh, is there are also a lot of developments going on where they use now HRTF for your regular, uh, for a PlayStation. Uh, so this means you also have uh, 3D audio there with some of the systems that we already mentioned. So basically, I think it's a development in general, but VR was a little bit, you know, ahead uh, uh, with that because it was really necessary to be there and to have your head exactly there and listen from the perspective of that player. Mm -hmm. Are you gonna, uh, do yeah, you of see course. any of these technologies you have developed being used in non-VR applications and games? And the question is yes, of course. Um, so I mean, we learned uh, a lot uh, from, from from these, and of course, like there's uh, already concepts of, of using that. Um, the good thing is, like on VR games, you kind of like the the player will definitely listen to headphones because like it's, it's the idea of the headset. Um, but of course, if uh, players are also willing to to uh, play more on headphones, and that's for, for most of the that, that's the case, then yes, you can use these concepts and use binaural, of course, also for other games. Um, also, the behavior is a bit different. Like, since uh, for example, for for collision, I mean, if you have a controller at, uh, in your hand, you basically uh, would press different buttons A and, and and so on, which is different if you actually have like a VR. Uh, where you can do much more interactions with that, but we will see how games will also change. And yes, of course, this is a, a concept that we will also adapt on other games. Um, and Michael has a good question here. Uh, when you switch from far perspective, a few emitters, to close perspective, more emitters, is this done via a mix change, uh, muting, unmuting the extra emitters, or do you have a system in place to spawn the extra emitters? Uh, do the extra emitters add to CPU load even when silent? That is a very good question, a very smart one, um, because uh, the point is um, that is exactly... So, 
this system with the clustering, um, it, it helps us in, in various ways. It helps us in having a very clear and uh, nice mix. It helps, it, it helps us in getting closer to object and therefore having a, a higher level of detail. But it also helps us in the way that we use it by uh, getting rid of emitters that we do not want to hear anymore and going uh, when we go closer to those, uh, to those objects and, and they are spawning as you say, additional emitters, then uh, you, uh, you hear those additional emitters and you don't hear the general emitter that it got spawned from. Uh, 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 you don't hear it anymore. So basically what we're doing, we, we're switching out emitters and we're creating and open them. And, and the real thing is it's not a silent, uh, it's, not, it's not just a wise thing with, okay, we are uh, further away, therefore uh, we don't hear the stuff, uh, muting, unmuting, or just virtual voices. It's not about virtual voices, it's really about spawning that emitter so therefore we get rid of emitters that we don't need and we spawn them if we need so you can see it a little bit like a like a lens you go through the world and where you are the details are, uh, are more uh, uh, are higher and when you move away from that they they get uh, uh, non-existent basically anymore and therefore we try to also compensate for the heavy uh, CPU usage that can come up in those situations I hope that uh, answered your question mm -hmm. Be great to hear your opinions on immersive music in games uh, as well. I guess Stefan, that's also a question for you. Yes, of course. Um, so, um, how should I put it? Um, we, we, the immersive music. So, uh, music in in VR is something that, that that I was thinking of quite some time over the course of the last years uh, because of the escape rooms and the games that we are working on right now. Um, the point is, we do have we we. In my opinion, music in VR needs to be reduced uh, as long as you use it in a, in a headlocked uh, functionality. So um, in, in the VR, in the games, the, in the escape games, we use it headlocked. We use it, you know, uh, normal so that it is a stereo mix that is on top. And when you move uh, your head, it just goes with your head. Um, I personally think that uh, it's time to rethink a little bit how music works and how music is played back and also to think and play a little bit what uh, diegetic uh, music means and non-diegetic music means and where there is maybe a sweet spot in the middle that works better for, um, uh, for VR games. But we can have a chat about that at some point in time as well. And uh, best regards to Crytek, by the way. Yes. Thank you, Michael. Andrew, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank You're you welcome, Michael. <laughs> So I think those are the questions. Yeah, thank you very much for your questions. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Chris. And unfortunately, I cannot scroll up. Ah, uh, Bertram and Bertram. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thanks for the cool questions. I think uh, if yeah. there is nothing else. Then thank you very much for yeah. listening to us. And yeah, have a great DEF Yeah, have a nice one. Bye-bye. Thank you.